going to record that. Recording is on. Okay. Um, Plastic Free July. Merci, OK. Plastic Free July is a growing movement um, of Plastic Free Foundation since 2000, 2011. The movement aims at reaching different people from different walks of life, from consumer to local authorities. We are all being urged to give up on our plastic addiction. Ever since in its introduction, plastic became a matter of conveniency. People opted for something light, cheap and flexible. But with the growing use of a material that is non-perishable and non-compostable, we soon had a big problem on our hands. Research has shown that by 2015, 2050, there will be more amount of plastic in the ocean than fish. While a lot of countries are embracing the just transition movement, in 2020, more and more people in industries come to understand the dangerous impact of plastic on our health, environment and economy. We have with us Madame Soubron um, of St. George from the Ministry of Environment, who will be intervening on the bans of plastic in Mauritius. We have with us Ishan Rai Ramdeni, sustainability specialist, holder of Bachelor's of Environmental Engineering from Monash University and independent researcher at Sustainable Turtle. From our conversation, we get that we are going to talk about plastic and planetary boundaries. Thank you for being here, Ishan. Um, if you would please walk us through. Well, hello everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity, Siddhartha. Um, I will just share my screen now. Um, cool, just give me one little second. And um, yeah, can you guys see my presentation screen? Yeah, sure. Cool. So I'll just present. Well, um, as Siddhartha mentioned, we have another uh, person, who, another panelist who will be like delving a little bit more in the local, local specific context. And uh, what I really wanted to do with this opportunity is to basically give a more academic, academic view of the whole problem. And um, so basically my intervention will be focused on plastic and our planetary boundaries. I'll be talking a little bit about peak oil. And uh, Piao Economics, uh, it's actually sort of a contextualization of the donut economics model, uh, which I think uh, some of you are aware of. So I'll just dive straight into it. So, hey, Mr. Plastic, or Ma Madame Plastic, I don't know. Why are you still fantastic? So I'm guessing that most uh, panelists know about this, but I'll just go through the basics. So plastics are petrochemical uh, are derived petrochemical products. The main raw materials, from my understanding, is ethylene and propylene. It's an essential component of our modern lifestyle. And it has also, like, the proliferation of plastic is no incident. It's not an accident. It was, uh, from my analysis, it was one of the major components of our growing global economy since the 1950s or so, since the real uh, shoot in the use of plastic. And uh, there's no denying it. Like, it's so fantastic because it's one of the most versatile man-made substances which has been created. That's a fact, like, uh, in my opinion. That's actually a fact. And um, based on all of those factors, as for previously mentioned bullet point, it has become an essential component of the Anthropocene. So Anthropocene is a big word, so let's just explain what this really means for us. So that's the definition uh, that I found on the internet on anthropocene.info. It's a really good website to delve like in depth into the topic. But basically the Anthropocene, um, you know, we have like, a, so let's talk about time scales. So the time scale for us today is like an hour, an hour or two. Like then we have a week, we have a month and a year. So that's uh, our subjective understanding of like time based on our human experience. But it's very good to understand that uh, we're also operating on a, a big scale, like on a geological scale. And that's really what the Anthropocene wants to demonstrate is like how our human subjective experience relates to the, uh, well, the geological scale. And so this infographic here basically shows you this. So we are at the top here. You see a little layer? That's basically what 
it's commonly known as the Anthropocene, like just a little layer here. And all of this, and that's in millions of years, that's basically the geological time scale. So the Anthropocene is still a scientifically debated term, but it's mostly agreed that it started around the 1800s, 1900s, depending on who you, which scientists you actually like follow. And Anthropo means human, and scene means epoch or time. Cool. Uh, just bear in mind this little graphic. I'll come back to it a little bit afterwards to give some more context. So the Anthropocene is also known as the age of exponentials. So what is meant by that is that everything, as you can see, like all of those environment indicators, CO2 concentration, and 2 o concentration, methane concentration, and so on, those indication substances as well. Well, as you can see, up till like uh, it was increasing, increasing with like human advance and human like um, progress, but it really shot up. Like there was uh, the rate of change really became like exponential. Around 1950s, it depends really like on which uh, environmental indicator you're looking at. And uh, so as you can see, it's uh, like exponential curve. It's actually going up. And uh, based on local, on the current context, uh, the most recent example of like an exponential surge is the pandemic. And we're all really aware of like, exponen like exponential growth now. Let's bring to the next slide. So the question like, which is on, which we should be asking ourselves in Plastic Pre July, maybe it's time to flatten the plastic curve. Um, this graphic here, I found it on Statista. Uh, it's a very good website. You should definitely like get a membership on that if you want to. So basically, plastics in the 1940s, 1950s, it started becoming like uh, something, like <laughs> started becoming, oh, maybe we can use it. Then uh, it shot up, like you can see, like in the space of about so 70, 80 years, I would say. It actually started increasing, increasing, increasing up to 2018 is the last data, set, data point here. So as you can see, it's the start of an exponential curve and depending on uh, data sources, it's actually an exponential curve, clearly net. And uh, fun fact of trivia, uh, in, the 1960, in 1967, there was a movie starring Dustin Hoffman. Maybe some people who are like, uh, watching movies in the time will remember Dustin Hoffman. He's a bit more gray-haired now. And it was the first like pop culture reference in a Hollywood movie about the potential of plastics to actually transforming our like interactions with the world, how it would revolutionize our economy. It's actually a really good movie. And uh, maybe like you could watch it on a lazy Sunday or something. Cool. So I think personally, I think it's time to flatten the plastic curve. And I think Siddhartha would agree with me. Cool. So staying in the, on the topic of curves, um, like it was said previously, Plastic is a petrochemical product. So what does this mean? In very simple terms, it means that you need fossil fuels, combustible fuel, to produce those plastic. The other intron, other like uh, raw materials which comes into it, the main one, uh, the cam cam, the cam cam, is actually <clears throat> fossil fuels. What's the issue with fossil fuels? I won't get into climate change just yet. But the issue with fossil fuels in terms of like extraction on the supply side of things uh, in macroeconomic terms is that in the 1990s, in, in the early 1900s, it was very easy to get petroleum. If you remember like uh, in the cartoons that we used to watch as kids, you just had to like, and could pierce down at air and you got like, loads of like oil coming up. It's a caricature but it's basically that it was very easy to get like uh, oil from the ground, from like uh, the world, the oil wells, and all other fossil, fossil fuel required for making plastics. So there was a rush to actually gather this oil for other purposes, transportation, energy production, traffic production as well. So that's when we were at this stage here, you see, like on the left-hand side of the curve. Now in modern times, um, about so about the year 2000, 2010, um, we reached a situation where when we require more energy to extract the oil for other purposes than uh, the energy we were getting out of the oil itself. Okay, the economy was getting out of the oil itself. So the net energy 
from the oil, where it's less. So this has sort of backed us in the corner because the whole of our infrastructure was built on the premise that oil will be plentiful and we'll be able to extract oil for all of the purposes we need before, oil and fossil fuels. So we reached a stage as per the International Energy Agency in uh, mid 2000, 2005, 2006, that uh, peak oil globally. So peak oil means that it requires, it is more expensive for economy to extract the oil for our purposes. Now the net benefit in terms of like financial, social, environmental, is going to become more detrimental. Cool. So this brings us to fracking. So like I mentioned before, conventional extraction methods of fossil fuels for anthropogenic use, so for human use. This time, ce temps est révolu. It's no longer feasible to do it. It's It has no longer been feasible to just extract oil in an easy way, in a conventional way, with conventional oil wells. Uh, we no longer can do that. So the human mind, in that we're so ingenious, and we're following basically a cornucopian philosophy, like technology will always save us. We came to the conclusion as a collective that while conventional oil is no longer, extraction is no longer viable. So that's agiter les ménages, think about like solutions which will be able to enable us to like just do it a little bit more. <laughs> that's where fracking comes in. And uh, so fracking is defined as a non-conventional uh, fossil fuel extraction method. And I'll just explain it in like very simple terms for you guys to understand. So basically, we know that uh, there's uh, oil present, let's say, in port risk, okay? But the oil present in port risk, it's not in a very accessible spot. Uh, the geological um, layout doesn't really allow for that conventional drilling and oil um, extraction to take place because it's sort of in a porous, like a uh, shale, sort of like a structure. We call it roche mer in like French. So what we do is that we drill a hole, we inject a lot of uh, a brine solution, water and stuff, um, to basically fracture this sort of sponge structure, create little pockets where we can actually like, um, so once the water goes in, we can extract it and get the fossil fuel, the required uh, material, the fossil fuel from this like shell, um, from this shell structure, La roche uh, this is a very intrusive process in a way, and it's very energy intensive. The people who are actually doing a lot of uh, fracking at the moment is the US, and um, they had a lot of problems, just to give you some context, from the COVID pandemic when the price of oil fell down. So seeing that the financial, the way they were structuring the financial um, instruments for their fracking infrastructure uh, industry, it sort of crumbled down because um, it was not very cost effective and seeing that the price of oil diminished it became like sort of a cast debt for them so that's basically fracking and uh so what the, does the hulk think about fracking um so you guys i guess you guys have watched the avengers uh in the avengers you have the hulk uh the hulk is played by mark ruffalo uh and mark ruffalo is actually an activist an anti-fracking activist in the united states and uh, let's just read what Mark Ruffalo has to say, the person who plays the Hulk. So fracking is an extreme form of oil and gas extraction. In, in other words, it's unconventional form of oil extraction. And it leads to water contamination. That's mostly groundwater wells in the vicinity of the shale uh, geological formation, which can get like uh, contaminated by the fracking process. Air pollution as well, because um, Again, it comes down to energy in a way. You need to put a lot of energy into the fracking process to extract the oil. And when you put a lot of energy, like you need very energy intensive activities, you release a lot of uh, greenhouse gases and other air pollutants. And earthquakes, that's a bit of a contentious topic. Um, there's no definite scientific um, proof, let's say consensus that fracking causes earthquakes but it's getting there from my perspective. Illness, 
this relates a little bit to groundwater contamination because people in the vicinity of the fracking well, they will extract uh, water from like, um, so wells that they know <clears throat> that have been here for a while, which have been using for like generations. So it seems that there's some seepage of like pollutants and gases in those uh, groundwater wells. You drink the water, it's no longer potable and they fall sick. It also exacerbates climate change in a way. I'll come back to it a little bit further down. It's not a direct climate change um, uh, factor, but it does affect it like in a en second degree. And turns communities upside down. Um, I'll just take the example of Port Twist again, just for contextualization here. Let's say we had like a, a, so a known site which can be viable for fracking in Port Twist. There will be a lot of like uh, disruptions to the communities around. And coming back to the United States, that's uh, actually a big point of like a contention because most of the uh, fracked uh, fossil fuels in the United States, now it's sort of like um, getting into territories of the indig indigenous tribes or the indigenous Americans. So that's a big uh, point of contention with regards to this whole industry. And I just wanted to put this here because like it's a very good diagram of uh, when we talk about oil spills, we always think about like the BP oil spill or the oil spill in the Antarctica, which happened like a while ago. Was, <clears throat> we always think about a tanker spilling oil into the ocean. It's not necessarily that. Um, as you can see, as we're all noticing now, we, we no longer can say that uh, claim plausible deniability. When you go for a hike near a river, you're going to see a lot of plastic. It's really disheartening because it's a sort of plastic pollution is oil pollution in a way. It's a symptom of our addiction to oil. And it's just a second degree addiction, like we don't see it. But at the base of things, plastics is an oil spill, a solid oil spill, as so clear, clearly laid out in this picture. It's growing. Now I'm going to bring you to the second part of my presentation, just to wrap all of this up. So why why PR economists? It's actually, like I said before, like uh, so the actual term is donut economics. That was developed by Kate uh, Kate Raworth early 2010. It uh, and I contextualize it from Mauritius because the donut is a PR, basically, <laughs> and uh, this was like a clever play on words. So basically, the PR economics is a new economic model which provides. Oh, okay. Um, so I'll just get back to it. So the PR economics basically tries to offer a framework, a new economic framework, to provide a safe and just space for all humanity. Okay, so it's one of the ways which was developed to cater for the social and environmental impacts of economic growth. And uh, as you can see in this diagram, we have 12 social foundations because you need something solid to build your society on. And the 12 social foundations, you can find them in this inner concentric circle here, which is water, food, health, everything basically that we, we needed during uh, the lockdown, for example. We needed this strong social fabric so as to see us through hard times, okay? And uh, of course, we don't operate in a vacuum. Like, uh, we, can't, we can't have a strong society if the ecosystem, the environment around us is crumbling. So this is why we need uh, to not exceed the resilience of our, ecologi of our ecological system. And that's where the environmental boundaries or planetary boundaries come into play. And in the environmental boundaries or planetary boundaries, you will see it's here listed in the outer concentric circle, sorry. And uh, you will see that it's climate change, ocean acidification, chemical pollution, and so on and so forth. So the aim of the PR <coughs> economy, sorry, is to actually uh, make sure that uh, the PR becomes a badger. <laughs> So it becomes like a really like, a, so we no longer have the hole in the middle, like all the foundations are like uh, clearly set and that we don't exceed the ecological ceiling so that it's a very solid um, 
So the piano is become a bug from my understanding. <laughs> And um, yeah, so there's a very good explanation which was made in this YouTube video, which I'm linking here. And um, yeah, I would encourage all of you to read up on it. I will publish an article as well soon on it to contextualize it for more from Mauritius, but let's move on now. So why I explained to you why I brought up the PR economics model, the donut economics, if you will, is that as I mentioned before, there are nine environmental boundaries or planetary boundaries, okay? That was the initial model. It was developed or popularized by the Stockholm Resilience Foundation, I think, um, with the help of Kate, of course. But now what was found is that uh, plastic, especially microplastic, has the potential to be classified as a planetary boundary. So instead of nine planetary boundaries, there's talk about maybe reviewing this like framework to include plastics in it. And uh, so it was actually a paper <coughs> which was published in the Journal of Marine Policy, which argued that it was published in 2018. It's free access. You can actually access it like for free and download it, very informatively. So why? So why do we think that it might be a 10th planetary boundary? Because it seemed to me the free conditions that was laid out at the start of the whole donut economics model, um, to define what is a planetary boundary. So let's go through it now, like, and based on our cumulative experience, let's see from our experience if it meets those three <laughs> criteria. So the first one is, is pollution reversible or poorly reversible? From my opinion, I guess, guess, is that it is poorly reversible. Um, let's say like a big piece of plastic is very, relatively easy to capture it, like if you have like um, nets and stuff, like at the mouth of rivers, like they're doing like some very good work, by on slant and stuff, the ocean cleaner project. So I would say it's fully reversible. And now some might argue that microplastics, not really because we are all sort of exposed to microplastics. So let's say the first point is yes. <clears throat> Our effect detectable when the problem is on planetary scale. Well, for me, yes, because <laughs> when this became a problem was that when we got a big plastic patch on the south of Texas, if I'm not wrong, like somewhere in the ocean, that's when we realized that, oops, maybe we made a mistake. Like we actually didn't have a responsible use of plastic. And that's when it, and it was all over the place. It was like all of a sudden, like just like this, we just said plastic is a problem and it was a problem globally. So for me, the second point is met. The third point is the uh, main point of contention is that is there a disruptive effect on the earth system processes? That I will leave it to the experts, because I'm a specialist, <laughs> not an expert, the expert to actually define it. Like, uh, because uh, it actually necessitates a lot of work, a lot of data sets, a lot of data points, like analysis, meta-analysis meta to actually define that. It's been two years now since the publication of this article, so I haven't had any like uh, updates on that, but this is still up in the air. So plastic has the potential to become one officially recognized as the 10th planetary boundary in line with climate change, ocean acidification, ozone layer depletion, chemical pollution, and all the rest. So that should give us really like uh, close to be alarmed and uh, take action, like really make the best that we can to ensure that this doesn't, this doesn't like proliferate as much. So I wanted to finish this presentation on like a link in, so how does plastic and climate change actually link to each other? Plastic doesn't cause climate change directly. That's if about the amalgam, okay? Like we need to have clear boundaries of what the problems are. Um, I've seen in a lot of like press articles recently, like uh, in newspapers, in that there's un prise de conscience, which is happening, that there's a lot of like uh, people who say plastic is causing climate change or something along those lines. It's not totally true. Um, it, it, is a, it is not a determining factor. It's a contributing factor in a way but it's not a direct factor which impacts climate change. Uh, 
on the other hand, how it affects climate change is in its production stage in a way, okay? <laughs> so this is an extract from like the Earth Institute of Columbia University, which uh, basically explains that if by 2030, our current trajectory of plastic production, not even demand, plastic production uh, is on the same rate, we could reach the equivalent of 300 new 50 megawatts coal-fired power plants on a global scale. And that's, just to give some context, that would be, seeing that the CB has about, just the CB, not the IPPs, just the CB has an install capacity of about 500 megawatts at the moment. That would be the equivalent of having 300 new Mauritius in terms of uh, CO2 contributions in the atmosphere. So that's a bit how plastic and climate change can be used in advocacy strategies, in policy management, but it's very important to make the distinction between the two. And uh, well, I'm just gonna leave it to here for now. It was a uh, very, well, thank you for your attention. Just a small word on like what I do. So basically my motto is slow and steady wins the race. Uh, I'm from Sustainable Turtle, which is a citizen initiative to provide lucid sustainability intelligence to the Mauritian audience. I do what I did here usually on my uh, social media platforms. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions or whatnot. Thank you so much, Jishan. That was like really comprehensive. Um, for highlighting plastic pollution and relating to the liquid oil spill, we do realize, and you made the strong point that we do have a plastic pollution addiction. And the analogy between Piao to Baja um, is going to definitely stay with us. <laughs> um, while bursting myth about plastic and raising using the alarm on plastic quality. Um, and thank you so much for being here today and really providing sustainability to us. Um, you did, you did um, grab a perspective on how plastic is actually becoming more and more of a problem. Um, if anyone in the audience has any questions. Well, I was if not, surprised. you can always ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> so, <to that point. laughs> um, so I guess we, we can move to Mrs. Mrs. Subron, um, if that's okay, and if any one of you have any questions, so you can just shoot it in the message box or um, at the end of um, the presentation itself. Okay. Thank you, Ishan. <laughs> Mrs. Subron. Um, I, I will share the screen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it's okay. Oh. <laughs> so you can see the so you can see the screen, please. Uh, at my end, it's frozen, but I'm not quite sure if everyone can see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's okay? Yes. Oui. Okay. <laughs> so I will present the, uh, what the ministry is doing for the uh, plastic in Mauritius to control plastic pollution. So I am myself, Mrs. Uh, Sudevi Subran mm -hmm. from the Ministry of Environment. I'm the Divisional Environment Officer of this ministry. And now I am in charge of the policy and planning division. So I will start with the facts and figures, as you will see. I have not gone to the international figures, but to the local figures. You see, we have about uh, 543,000 tons of solid waste that was generated in 2018 and seven. 6,000 tons were plastic, that is 14%, and only around 4% are recycled. 
In that, we have about 128 million PET bottles that are commercialized, and this goes into the waste stream when it is used. Up. And only about 40% of PET bottles, used PET bottles, are recycled annually. So, uh, for the plastic waste characterization in Mauritius, you will see that uh, uh, in the first chart, you will see that we have the different types of waste that we have, and plastic is 14%, paper 14%, and we have uh, yard waste 27%, food waste 27%, and glass and metal, both of them over 3 and 3%. When we uh, have the characterization of the plastic, we have different types of plastic, the LDP, HDP, the PET, the uh, PVC, the polystyrene. So you will see the different percentage. There was a characterization that was done and the, uh, and the percentage are shown on the graph. So uh, we all know that plastic takes a lot of time to degrade and in the landfill, it takes up to uh, 1,000 years to fully degrade. So what are the impacts that we are getting from plastic pollution? First, we saw, uh, we see that there is a lot of ISOs. We see uh, everywhere plastic, given that we are a touristic uh, uh, island. Uh, we can't have all the waste are all around the island. We have to clean, but we see all, uh, everywhere the liters everywhere and in the water bodies also. When we have this plastic waste in the, our drains and canals, we get flooding. And we had a lot of consequences in the past uh, with the flooding. We also have another problem uh, of health, health, that is when we leave this plastic uh, everywhere there is accumulation of water and uh, there is mosquitoes that proliferates inside and we get these problems uh, for example if there is a problem of chikungunya and then it, it becomes aggravated we also get air pollution from burning of plastic uh, we see uh, all the plastic that are from the rivers, from the land, from the rivers, it goes in the marine. And this is the photograph that is showing. This is not now, but it was previous photograph taken at the port, port, and we see a lot of debris in the port. And now with the COVID-19, we know we are using a lot of plastic, like masks, the, the, the sanitizers, uh, our food packaging, so a lot of plastic was generated for the COVID-19. So what now our government is doing? You see, we had our government program. It says that we have to make our Mauritius a plastic-free country within the nearest possible delay. And the policies that are being adopted are we have to strengthen our legislation and we have to promote alternatives. We have to promote reuse and recycling. We have to encourage continued sensitization, awareness, raising and cleanup. And we have to support uh, research and development. So these are the philosophy. We have to first, we have to reduce, then reuse and then recycle. Uh, now I will go on the uh, laws that have been prepared by the Ministry of Environment to control plastic pollution. The first law which was prepared was the Environment Protection uh, Pet Battle Permit Regulation. This dates back to uh, 200 and 2001. And the aim was to manage pet battles based on the polluter pays principle. And only the local pet butlers, but bottling companies, were required to collect the pet bottles and recycle. And it was mainly the beverage companies like Coca-Cola, Pepsi-Cola, and water. Uh, those bottling water were, uh, were regulated under this uh, 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 pet bottle regulation. So what happened, we have seen that uh, when we have 
put this regulation, there was not much recycling that were being carried out. As I said in my introduction, that only 40% as of now is being uh, recycled, the pet bottles. Uh, so we have this government had to give a lot of incentives. So the in incentive started from uh, 2014, where we gave 15 rupee per kg, but it should have exceeded 1,000 ton. Then they would benefit that 15 rupees and 20 kilo, uh, 20 rupee per kilo when exceed uh, uh, 1,500 tons. Then we see that was also not working. In 2015, we came with another incentive. It was five rupee per kg of pet exported, and it was the threshold was only one ton. This was also not giving very good result. Then in 2018, uh, we said that we are going to give 15 rupees per kg of pet recycle to the local local people who are recycling. So this was to encourage our recyclers. And uh, to, in 2019, we gave 15 rupees per kg of pet exported also. So previously it was uh, five rupees, but it increased to 15 rupees for exported, for, for exportation. So both for now for exportation and uh, uh, local recycling, they get 15 rupees per kg. So this, this table is showing how uh, the percentage of pet bottle recycling evolved. You see in, in 2011, it was 37% and then it decreased. And now in uh, 2019, it was 43% of, of used pet bottle, which was collected for uh, recycling. It was not recycled in Mauritius, but it was exported for recycling. So uh, now uh, we wanted to uh, make, to amend, because our reg uh, regulation for pet uh, butter dates back, back to 2001. And now we are going to uh, amend this regulation. Uh, you see, previously it was only Pepsi for Pepsi, Coca, and water, but uh, pet bottles. So uh, now we are going to uh, amend this uh, regulation to extend the producer responsibility because we see now a lot of, of, of uh, things that are being uh, put in the pet bottles. For example, we have not only the carbonated drink and water, but also have juice, uh, syrup, vinegar, and dairy products. Also, we are going to have a lot of uh, a lot of people who are importing uh, a lot of thing in the pet bottle so this will also be captured in our regulation that is going to be amended so these are the some of the photographs of the pet bottles for the for example for the vinegar and dairy that we are going to include now i go uh, to the plastic bags you know the plastic bag regulation the banning of plastic bag regulation was uh, promulgated in 2015 and came into force in January January 2016 this ban import manufacture sale and supply of plastic bag and it included the uh, non woven polypropylene and i will show a, a diagram a photograph for the uh, non-woven because most of the time they, many people they confuse they say that this is not uh, plastic but it is uh, like textile textile uh, bags in that regulation we had also exempted some plastic bags such as roll-on bin bags bags for agricultural purpose and the pocket type bags which is used now for what we say is a confi and uh, uh, for the confi that we use uh, and for dal dalpuri and also the biodegradable and compostable uh, plastic bag were also exempted in the list so you see we have to promote uh, biodegradable and compostable bags these were also 
monitored. We had to give uh, the registration certificates. And through the registration certificates, we have been able to monitor how much we have been able to import. So from the figures that we have collected, we see that from 2016, we have been able to import about 21 million uh, plastic uh, biodegradable compostable plastic bag and we have manufactured uh, 188 million uh, plastic bag uh, biodegradable one. We also did some uh, uh, enforcement from then. You see, they say that the, uh, our plastic bag regulation was not very, very, very effective. But despite that, we had done uh, a lot of enforcement. Enforcement, we have had uh, contravention taken. And, and as of now, we have around 628 contravention has been taken. We have also br brought people to uh, court and prosecuted them for uh, 158 uh, cases and we have also seized plastic bags at port and it is around 766,000. You see here, you will see uh, in our hypermarket and supermarket, this regulation is, is working perfectly because you see they are using their paper bag, their biodegradable bag. But where the, the regulation has not worked is with small, well, in the markets, vegetable markets, and in small shop, they still use this uh, roll-on plastic bag for for everything except for frozen uh, for meat and fish. So now we are bringing uh, amendment to this plastic bag regulation. So now you will see we are going to have ban for the process if anybody is going to possess a plastic bag they are going to be uh, uh, sanctioned uh, also for import, for manufacture, sell and supply. Import, manufacture, sell and supply were present in the previous uh, reg regulation, but process, individual processing of bags was not that. So we are going to include that in our, our regulation. We are also going to do testing with an apparatus, which is called the FTIO, the Fourier Transform Infrared. And uh, also we are going to look at the fine that are being uh, imposed. It is up to 10,000 rupees, but now it will be reviewed for possession, use, uh, trade and import. And it will be much, much more higher than 10,000 rupees. Also, we are going to remove this uh, transparent roll-on plastic bag, which was previously only for fish, meat, and frozen thing. But now we are going to remove it totally from uh, from the list. It will be banned. The small uh, pocket type bags also will be banned. And also the plastic bag, which are intended to be exported, will be banned. You will, you will see here that for export also we are going to do that because what happened uh, there are a lot of manufacturers here they uh, they produce this bag they say that it is intended to be exported but they uh, they use it locally and it is not serving our purpose for the banning of the plastic bag regulation so these are the plastic bag, uh, which are banned this is the uh, non-woven plastic bag which you see everywhere uh, uh, and it is it is a ban product, and the roll roll on also we are going to ban in future. Now I am going to uh, talk about the single use uh, plastic container. Uh, we have named it product because in future we are going to add other products also uh, as single use uh, so that they can be banned. But for the time time being. Uh, this is a uh, new regulation that is being introduced and uh, we are going to ban about 10, no, not about, exactly 10 items and it is uh, the plates, cup, bowls, trays, straw, food containers, the hinge type and also the fork, knife, spoon and chopsticks. So these are the products that are going to ban in future which are made of, of plastic. 
Now I go to the awareness and, and sensitization. You see at the Ministry of Environment, we have a division that is doing the sensitization and awareness. We have to, uh, we, we go to the different target group, the children in the school, the youth, the woman community and senior citizen to sensitize them on plastic pollution. We do a lot of radio talks and TV program and we talk about the impacts of plastic and alternative to plastic to them. So these are some of the sensitization and awareness on plastic issue that was carried out in the past where uh, the theme was on plastic for the world and humanity. Now I will talk on the alternative to plastics. You know, uh, for plastic we we have uh, a lot of alternatives and we have to promote them. For example, for plastic bags, we have uh, cloth bags, jute bags, and also the long lasting bags that can be used. So these are the alternatives. For bottles, we have the stainless steel bottle that we can use. And these are being promoted uh, in all our events that are being organized by this ministry. We are also empowering our prisoners to uh, to do these uh, textile bags, the bags which are made up of cloth. And also we are, we are seeking collaboration with private sector to for the distribution of eco-friendly and long-lasting bags to all the household in Mauritius. So these are the eco-friendly bags. For, for example, we have the cloth bag. This is uh, uh, the, the long lasting, the, this is a nylon bag. This is a woven bag which we use when we go to, for shopping. Uh, this is a tantrafia. And this is from our uh, how we say when uh, we use our billboards which is our plastic we can reuse it and make the plastic uh, bags so for the biodegradable containers we see a lot of biodegradable containers made up of uh, paper this is made up of palm this is made up of sugarcane sugarcane pellets is also the long lasting containers we we are using a lot at home so what we to reduce plastic we can bring our our containers and have it weighted and put our our cereals here, our uh, lentils, our and and bring in these containers. This is alternative to pet bottles. These are the stainless steel bottles that are being promoted in our ministry, and we see a lot of uh, students also nowadays using this bottle. And also, uh, you see, uh, our water, uh, they say that it is not very, they are not very uh, clean. So these fountains are being installed in school so that our school children can get filtered water. And this is being done by the NGO called SIA. Also, this is the uh, fil fountain with filter which can be installed in office to have filtered water now for the recycling uh, you see this ministry is also uh, for promoting recycling and uh, some uh, 50 eco beans were distributed to the local authorities and social welfare centers for the proper uh, disposal of used pet bottles and this, when they are collected in these uh, bins, they were sent for recycling. We have a lot of NGOs also that are involved in the collection of plastic uh, bottles and waste. And they, some of them are registered at this ministry. We had the beach authority also placing a lot of recycling bins on the beaches so that they collect can collect the pet bottles and also the solid waste management uh, uh, division of our ministry is working on the deshetri that will be put around at the island so that the waste could be sorted easily and sent to the recycler 
very easily. And also in our EIA and PEO licenses, we are imposing conditions so that we can uh, have the recycling of pet bottles done, especially at the hotels. So this is the mapping of the plastic recyclers and exporters. You will see the different places we have the recyclers. And then the déchetterie will be at different places so that the, the, uh, the plastic recyclers can go directly there and have their, 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 their plastic bottle so that they can recycle them. And then they will not have a long way to travel. The transportation costs will be reduced. So these are some of the products uh, from recycled plastic. We can do have benches. This is for uh, walls, tables, benches. So these are the products that are being produced in Mauritius. We are also in our policies, I said that there should be research and development. So there are research that are being carried out at our National Environment Laboratory. They are doing a lot of tests on the plastic that are coming on the on on our island in the market, and also there is work being done, research work that is being done by University of Mauritius and the MOI. The University of Mauritius, we have told them to do the biodegradability and compostability test, and uh, the MOI is working on the microplastic in Lagoon. And also, the, our ministry is, uh, you see, we don't have a lot of funds locally. Uh, we have to mobilize funds. We are seeking funds from uh, different international donors. We have the GF, Global Environment Facility, the FFM, the Fonds Francais pour l'Environnement Mondial, the Global Challenge uh, uh, Research Fund, this is in UK, and from NORAD. This is a Norwegian agency for development cooperation, uh, NORAD. And, and uh, uh, th uh, this is a project for empty pesticide container. Uh, we had a, a, this project was done uh, on a small scale by the small grant program, but now it is being upscaled by another project where we are getting funds from the GF so that the, we can uh, recycle all the pesticide containers around the island, uh, island of Mauritius. So um, that's all. Thank you very much for your attention. If you have any question, you can uh, ask. Uh Thank you very much. I do have one little question. Like, uh, do you have, uh, you talked about uh, consigne, by the way, you know, where you take a plastic, uh, glass bottle, like, like they do in like, um, I think in Sweden, <clears throat> it's a bit weird yes. to extend the producer responsibility, where mm -hmm. like you encourage people to take a particular, let's say a beer bottle or like mm -hmm. a water bottle and they go and put it back in the supermarket to get like uh, some cash back or yeah uh, but this is working very well for the glass bottle but for the pet bottle we have tried but it had not worked you see uh, what they say they say that uh, it is taking a lot of time a, a, a lot of space because we have small shop and a lot of plastic waste, and these are giving problem to uh, rodents, pests. So that's why it has not worked. This, but if this has not worked, okay, yeah. okay, thank you. Thank yeah, you. but probably uh, I think uh, Madame Lassemillon La can can talk more about that. Uh, if I think she is there. From the Felix Beverage Limited. Yes, I am there, but I'm not a panelist. I'm just uh, listening to the to the conversation. Okay. But uh, this is a this is not uh, this is not something that is being uh, promoted is to be discussed here. Yes. <laughs> okay. Any other question you have? Uh, I think we have a question in the chat, Siddhartha. Mm -hmm. 
Sí, sure. Yeah, from SAP. Uh, okay. like, can we see it? Do you have the equivalent figure to that in Mauritius? Um, oh, there is one, but I can't see. Mm -hmm. Thanks for gathering the very interesting panel. I'm not sure. Okay, this is just a not really a question for me. Um, if you want to ask a question. Um, I think it's anything, so uh, Dr. I to you now. Um, thank you so much for your intervention. That was really insightful in terms of um, the ministry's in input um, so far into the bans of plastic. And um, it's been really interesting to know that there's a lot of things that as commoner we don't know about. So the polypropylene bag were one of them where we use them and people actually sell them in the market while it's not yeah. being allowed to. Thank you for that, um, and thank you for being here today. Uh, the question was about the, the equivalent figures and value in motion rupees. Um, so, um, we 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 do tend to to have a very international perspective on what is in terms of plastic regarding to all our initiative bans and everything. But I guess there's a lot more research that is needed for in an island, so as much as is a state, um, this is the aim of the conversation, to, to know where our loops hold are and how we can, with different partners and different stakeholders, go ahead into research and development, having people being in the system field, having people in the plastic industry and having people from the ministry to be able to continue the conversation and this is one of the first that is um, that is being um, gone through this plastic free uh, journey motion. So um, unfortunately, I don't think we have a real answer to that question, um, but we'll get that. We still have a few more days till plastic free July is over. <laughs> we really hope to be able to find a proper answer to that. And if you do find the answer, please ping us. We'll be so glad to be able to continue the conversation. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I can add here. So the, the cost of plastic pollution is not, not easy to be calculated. You have to know uh, how much how much it is doing harm to the environment in terms of uh, ISO, if the tourist is not coming, how much tourists will not be coming in the future, if the drain is blocked and someone is killed, can we put a, a price for somebody who, who has been killed on, in the flooding? So it is very difficult. For example, if we burn these plastic, plastic bags, the plastic, uh, uh, plastics and we get this furan and dioxin and we get other types of diseases so this is all uh, these are the indirect uh, health impact that are d being that we have and it is difficult to estimate the cost yeah yeah just to bounce on this it's true that like um like Siddhartha yeah. said and how you mentioned this as well is that um there's, there's lack of data. It's always like this in Mauritius, saying that we're small and in developing state. And that's what uh, pushed me to actually start my own initiative because there's there's a lack of information, I would say, but there's a lot of data available. Like uh, Statistics Mauritius does a very good job of publishing their environmental digest every year or so. And um, it's just that it takes a lot of time to compile all of this information and find prox information proxies which are really good like um, quality levels, you could say, or accuracy levels. And then to put this in an economic model to actually give you like a financial 
uh, value for a lot of those externalities which are created from plastic usage. So I can say that from my own like experience, even in like um, countries like in the EU or even in the US, they're actually starting to develop like uh, the sort of financial forecasting or backcasting models to actually put a value commensurate like all of this impact and put an actual dollar or rupee value on those impacts. And there's like Gael Giraud, who does a very good job of this. Uh, he's on his way to win a Nobel Prize in economics if he does, but um, it will take time. There's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of data crunching and data mining, so I have to be able to provide such high quality information, which will definitely be useful, especially in terms of policy development and actually more business centric approach as well, so as to enforce more um, effective like uh, plastic um, reduction targets. Yeah. Uh, you're on mute, Dr. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much for that. So, um, thank you for not finding me that was on mute. Um, I think we are almost at the end of this conversation. It was such a pleasure to be able to talk to like minded people about plastic. <laughs> it's not always easy to find people who um, have their own set of expertise, especially pertaining to, to plastic in Mauritius, Mauritius right now. Um, but happy to have you here. And I hope you are being as plastic free as possible during this journey. Um, thank you so much for your contribution. I'll be posting the link of this recording on different um, on different platforms. So Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. If you're interested to continue this journey with us, please feel free to share what you're doing. And, and thank you, really, really thank you for your contribution today. Um, if there's nothing to add, I think we can bid farewell here. Okay, oh, thank, thank you very you. much, everyone. It was a pleasure. Okay, thank, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a pleasant free weekend. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.